Imagine that every year, terrorist attacks would kill more than 1 million people and injure another 20 million with shootings and bombings all over the world. Imagine that on top of that, these terrorists would unleash chemical weapons in the biggest cities around the globe. Toxic gas that would end up killing around 6.5 million people, again, year by year. Furthermore, imagine that the side effects of these terrorist attacks would even harm the environment on a long-term and very alarming scale. In fact, imagine that if the terrorists kept attacking, the entire ecosystem of our planet would transform into chaos. As you might have realized, I'm not actually talking about terrorists here. But what is it that's killing and injuring so many people every year and destroying the planet? The threat I'm talking about is the car. Or more precisely, internal combustion engine vehicles. All the numbers you just heard are, however, true. Motor vehicles kill 1.25 million people and injure another 20 to 50 million every year. Their emissions are a big contributor to air pollution. And air pollution is now considered the fourth largest human health concern, killing 6.5 million people each year. And lastly, cars are also contributing to global warming. The transport industry in general is responsible for about 22% of energy-related global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, if we again switch cars with terrorists, I think it's very clear that such a scenario would lead to an even bigger global war on terrorism. But why isn't that the case when we talk about the actual cause of these horrifying statistics? Why is there a war on terrorism but no war on cars? In order to understand this, we have to go back in time, but not too far. Actually. Because our love affair with the car is actually still pretty young. Here is the safest place to be, in the modern home on wheels. When cars took off during the 1920s, pedestrians still had to get used to this new transportation device. Back then, streets were filled with people. Pedestrians went anywhere they wanted in the street, and there were no crosswalks and very few street signs. As more and more cars disturbed the public life and caused fatalities, pedestrians in urban areas became increasingly angry. Peter Norton, the author of Fighting Traffic, the Dawn of the Motor Age in the American City, says that newspapers from American cities in the 1910s and 20s were filled with lots of anger at cars and drivers. Caricatures and newspaper stories in cities portrayed cars as death machines, invading the public space of pedestrians. For example, in 1923, a petition was signed by 42,000 people in Cincinnati to limit the speed of cars mechanically to 25 miles per hour. This surging public outcry over cars alarmed the auto industry, which set itself on a quest to shift the blame for car accidents and fatalities from drivers to walkers. A collective of special interest groups, including oil companies, automakers, car dealers and car clubs, launched campaigns all over cities in America. Kids would stand on the sidewalk, handing out flyers to pedestrians, alarming them of the danger to cross the street. The term jaywalking was born and increasingly used to ridicule pedestrians who crossed the street at the wrong place. And deals between the car industry and newspapers meant that stories about car accidents suddenly blamed pedestrians rather than drivers. This and other lobbying efforts later led to anti-jaywalking laws and fines for people who crossed the street at the wrong place. Moreover, it ultimately changed the public's worldview. Somebody on a bike or on foot was suddenly no more seen as traffic, but an obstruction to traffic. And the streets and cities changed from this to this. In the following decades, the world's love affair with cars grew year by year. As car manufacturers tapped into consumers' emotions, portraying the private automobile as the ultimate expression of freedom and independence. Tom Vanderbilt, author of Traffic, Why We Drive the Way We Do, says that during this era, especially in the United States, even city planners often didn't consider pedestrians as a factor in their models. The overriding goal of city design and engineering in America was to allow motor traffic to circulate unhindered. As a result, many streetcar and metro railway companies went bankrupt. Cars subsequently became not only a transportation device, but a way to express one's character and social status. 
Today, life in our cities and rural areas cannot be imagined without cars and other motor vehicles. Cars are a central part of our world, and much of our economic systems and city planning are still designed in a way that prioritizes cars as central transportation technology. This, however, is poised to change soon. It seems that in recent years, the automotive industry has jumped on top of Silicon Valley's disruptions. More and more so-called autotech startups are emerging, major funding deals are made, and tech giants such as Google, Uber, and Apple seem all to be working on electrifying and automating motor vehicles. The most prominent player in this space being, of course, Tesla. I think that Silicon Valley views the car exactly as I portrayed it above. An outdated technology that destroys not only lives, but also the planet. But not only that, cars are, from the perspective of Silicon Valley, extremely narrow computers on wheels. They are relatively unintelligent. They are unbelievably inefficient as cars are on average parked and unused for 96% of their lifetime. Furthermore, cars are often not even connected to the internet. And there's no unifying platform that would allow third-party software to run on them. Therefore, and of course, following their change the world mantra, Silicon Valley seems to be determined to solve the car problem. But where will these new efforts by Silicon Valley players lead us to? How will the future of the car and street life look like? I think that Silicon Valley's efforts will ultimately make individual car ownership obsolete. What we'll most likely see is a transformation towards on-demand, autonomous and electric vehicles, owned by fleets, not individuals. This is usually referred to as mobility or transport as a service. A recently published report by independent think tank RethinkX suggests that by 2013, 95% of US passenger miles traveled will be served by such a transportation system. This report argues that the disruption by autonomous electric vehicles will come much more rapidly than the mainstream of the industry thinks. This dramatic shift from individual car ownership to transport as a service offers lots of new business opportunities for tech companies. Because not only would such a shift shrink the automotive market, it would also mean that the companies who will reap the majority of the benefits and who would be positioned closest to consumers wouldn't be the traditional car manufacturers, but platform providers, companies developing autonomous vehicle operating systems and computing platforms. For consumers, this shift will result in a variety of benefits. A transport as a service system would drastically reduce the amount of cars needed while improving the usability of each car. Rethink X suggests that the usability of a car would grow from 4% today to 40% by 2030. These efficiency gains would also reduce transportation costs and significantly increase disposable income for households, about $1 trillion per year of additional pocket money for Americans. According to Rethink X report, a transport as a service system would cost below 10 cents per mile, compared to 73 cents for a new internal combustion engine or 61 cents for a new electric vehicle. Even a paid off internal combustion engine car would still cost 31 cents per mile and therefore be much more expensive than the transportation as a service solution. Another important factor contributing to lower costs is the electrification. Electric vehicles have much less maintenance costs, less fuel costs and are much more reliable than internal combustion engine cars. This will furthermore reduce insurance costs, especially when these vehicles are autonomous and will therefore be virtually accident-free. In fact, one could even imagine that some rides could become completely free due to other revenue models, such as advertisements, data monetization and entertainment. Imagine, for example, a Starbucks cafe on wheels, bringing you to the city center or the airport. And there are even much more second-order consequences. For example, how will advancements in battery technology affect the energy industry? Or what will happen with all the parking space, all that property in cities and elsewhere? And how will all of this affect the retail and logistics industry? 
If traffic jams, congestion and searching for parking become things of the past, how would the design of cities change? And how would the street life look like in a world full of autonomous and clean vehicles? So maybe we should really start changing our worldview about cars and the automotive industry. The same way we once shifted our worldview about cigarettes and the tobacco industry. Maybe we should take the negative consequences of traditional cars as seriously as we take terrorist attacks. Maybe we should realize that not too long ago, our streets looked like this. And now they are basically looking and feeling like this. So maybe we should really see cars again as an obstruction to pedestrians and not the other way around. Recently, Elon Musk said the following during an interview. People are mistaken when they think that technology just automatically improves. It does not automatically improve. It, it only improves if a lot of people work very hard to make it better. I think he's right. Technology does not improve by itself. If you want to have a better, cheaper, more efficient and more sustainable and less dangerous transportation technology and more pedestrian and bicycle friendly streets, it is up to us to change our worldview and to envision and shape the future. Thank you.